um, find the wire. Uh, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna write to the uh, support people and ask them to fix this room. Either point the camera over there, or you know, if people keep moving the table. Um, all right. So today uh, we're gonna have relatively brief uh, slides. Then, uh, for lack of a better term, a quiz. But don't stress about it too much. Um, and uh, then, depending on time, we'll uh, we'll give you some time to work on the deployment assignment. Um, okay. So uh, announcements: uh, the deployment assignment should have gotten released like just now at the start of class. It's due uh, like midnight on the ninth, uh, which is like two weeks or so. Uh, and let's see. Yeah, and we're going to talk through what I mean for that uh, next, and then, you know, but I fully expect that, it, like, almost each team is going to have kind of a different answer to this question, in a sense, or a different solution to how you do this assignment. Um, so we can figure that out. Uh, one quick note, I had to move my office hours again on Friday because of conflicts with interviewing people. Uh, so at 2.30 or 4.30. Tomorrow, I guess. Uh, I think today's Tuesday, so it's not really helping my week. Any questions? Okay. Uh, do you see it in grade school? I assume somebody had to have opened it already. All right. Um, okay. So, yeah, release now, due April 9th. Uh, as you know, I always do 20 through 59, uh, but uh, because otherwise I can't math, because like, if there's one thing that you will discover if you stay in programming for the rest of your career, you never get rid of off by winners. So they will they will just plague you forever. Um, so starting off, uh, question one and question two. Um, so basically it's like give me the GitHub repo and branch. So as you may or may not know, um, the URL of the GitHub repo when you change branches, it puts it in the URL. So make sure you're in the right branch, then kind of copy and paste the URL, uh, just so I make sure we're on the right branch. <clears throat> it is a common problem for a student team to give me the like main branch, which will not have any branch in the URL. And then I go and evaluate it, and then it's um, I go, it looks like you have done nothing. Uh, so make sure you get the right one, okay? Related to that, make sure you have pushed your code or something to GitHub, right? You should be doing this already, um, you know, unless you have, like I said, some alternate uh, solution to how you're doing this. Uh, but you know, backups are your friend, and if nothing else, Git slash GitHub is a backup. Okay, find the wire. Um, the uh, so you know, make sure you're doing something there, uh, and uh, you know, because that's where we're going to kind of go look at. All right, then working URL. Now what this means, it may mean uh, there's actually something I can go and look at, okay, as an output. Um, but if you need to talk about it with us, you know, like the instructional staff about what kind of thing you can put in here. But basically this is a, I want to see this working, okay? So where can I go see it working? So one, oh, sorry, one caveat, which I haven't mentioned, okay, is that I do not expect your projects to be done. Okay, by any stretch of the imagination. What I do expect is to be able to see that you're making some progress. Does that make sense? All right, so, so you're not going to be evaluated on completeness by any stretch of the imagination. Just kind of the fact that you are getting somewhere and that you have um, a, mo uh, like a mechanism for uh, releasing the application. Does that make sense? Okay. And like I said, Particularly in this class, there's going to be a lot of variability in these answers. All right, question three. Um, so this is basically a document, okay? That is how you could I could replicate your work to make that working URL do something. Okay. So there's two flavors of that. One is if I wanted to replicate what you were doing for the working stuff, but I also wanted to make changes to the code. Okay, how would I do that? Okay, and then there's the other version, which is production, which is like how would you deploy it such that it's not for development mode, uh, but instead is actually being used. That belongs in a file in your GitHub repo called 
either it can be directly in your README um, or in one called deployment. And this naming convention is relatively important uh, for a couple of reasons. One, anybody coming along and looking at your uh, repo will instantly know what to expect in those two places, um, as well as GitHub and GitLab and other tools make uh, like operate uh, like they do things sometimes based on these. So, for example, GitHub, if you have a file called readme.md in your main uh, root of your repo, uh, it will display it in Markdown layout uh, to anybody who comes to the repo, right? So that's not, there's no magic that happens there where you're specifying that this file is what's displayed. It just does it based on the file. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know if anybody has this bullet, like the third bullet. I think not. I don't think anybody has a deployment guide so far. Um, so think about that. Again, this is worth talking to us if you are unsure how to approach this problem. Um, and then the last thing is just, this is more, if you do have an appointment guide already, I'm gonna be looking very carefully for arrows and typos, but I would also be looking for a contributing uh, .md file. So there's at least, I'm gonna say four kind of, well, five really. So there's at least five common files you see in repos, okay? So readme, number one, most important, almost, certainly required on any repo you produce that's public. Um, number two is license, same as it goes there. So what license is this code under, okay? But that's not an MD file, it's just license. Then third is um, contributors. Well, actually, so the last three are kind of way more optional. So the one that you should probably already have, but may not, which is fine too, and we can figure that out, is one called contributors, which is um, basically the list of GitHub account names that have contributed to this code base. So it's both used for um, like thanks, but it's also used a lot of the time uh, to manage access control, okay? So in fact, most of the Spark infrastructure uses a contributors file that manage access control. Um, that one is kind of, sometimes it's just contributors, sometimes it's contributor.md, uh, you'll see both. Next one is this contributing MD one. I would say this is even kind of more optional as well as deployment. Both of these, um, these are often just the content is still there. It's just that they're right in the readme, if you follow me. But sometimes it's like complex enough that you push it out into its own file. That makes sense? Okay. Let's see, question four. So this is kind of, this is what your project will ultimately be graded on. So we're gonna score your kind of current state, okay? Um, the, the impact of this overall grade is as if a homework, right? So it's not like anywhere near the point value of the project, right? So that's what I'm saying is don't worry too much about completeness or that kind of stuff, but we are gonna get a sense of, of your status, okay? Um, and then issues, this is probably true for all of you, but uh, it really bothers me if I if I go to one of your student projects or whatever and I don't find any issues, okay? It could be that you're managing the issue somewhere else, like in a Trello board or something like that that's kind of like being used as requirements um, or whatever. But, uh, you know, like I said, I think for, the, for your projects, this is probably less important, um, but it is a common way to use issues to indicate what you're gonna work on next, okay, and allocate work. So despite the name, having issues, it's kind of funny to say, having issues is not actually a problem, okay? All right, next we have uh, question five, which is continuous deployment. So what I would like to be able to see is that, that you know, I make a change to the GitHub repo somehow, and the working URL changes, okay? Um, so, this can be, you know, to a like relatively lightweight. Um, you know, it doesn't have to do a ton of stuff. It, it can just be very simplistic, particularly at this point. Okay. Um, so again, any of these seem like you know you go. I don't know how to apply this to my project. That's what you should talk to us about. Okay. Uh, all right. Any other questions? I think that was the last slide. 
Yeah, so again, just office hours are changed for tomorrow. Just keep that in mind. I apologize for keeping for continuously, uh, for changing it all the time. I really don't like changing them at all, uh, but I am not managing the schedule entirely. All right, so let's make this do its thing. And my favorites. So hopefully some of you uh, actually managed to read the CICD um, uh, article uh, that uh, was linked to in the syllabus that was due for today. Um, so please sign in here. Please um, use your real first name. Um, you know, basically, if you put in some random thing, then I can't trace back who did what. Um, so. We'll wait for you all to join. Not everybody yet, right? Uh, Shu, Chris, if you want to participate, feel free. Oh, I don't know. Then you might win, though. So. Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let develop my idea. <laughs> right, you have to fail a couple of questions. Um, so I will. The reason this is only kind of sort of a quiz is because there are definitely topics in here that are not in that reading, um, and so you might know them, which would be cool. But I'm also kind of using them as a way to talk about them. All right, who's not in yet? Anybody? Oh, okay. All right, let's click the old button. I, I thought I usually got like a, a control button too, or a control like window for some reason. Uh, I hope you all appreciate the sparkly background that I chose because I like it. All right, so who should reject PRs with broken code? It also might be a little fast. Looks like you are. Pull request. All right. Um, so this is the correct answer. This is a long way for a lot of projects. It's a it's a difficult challenge. But basically, the idea here is that whenever somebody makes a change to the application, um, and then they want to add it to the application they've actually forked the application and they have um you know made their changes or whatever usually you try to do it in a branch so they kind of, kind of stay together but then you do what's called a pull request which is the weirdest terminology for this but basically you push it to the um, the original repo as what's called a pull request which it does make sense in that you're requesting that the maintainers pull your code is what it really means. Um, in many projects that have proper CI CD set up, uh, it will do this automatically. Okay, so uh, it will initiate the pull request. Uh, like you'll submit the pull request, then some automated tests will be run against it. Then uh, usually there's a human in the loop component where, um, depending on the size of the project, at least two of the maintainers of the project will uh, say something like LGTM, which is what's good to me. Um, then another bot will see that there were two of them uh, and that the test passed and they will merge the code. Okay, so that's what this means. Um, so there is a human usually involved somehow, but the, the activity is all completely done by bots. Um, and you see this, and when you see it done right, um, the maintainers don't actually even have access to uh merge code like they can't even do it okay there is some special account out there that's admin or whatever uh, but typically speaking the maintainers can't even change it uh so this is annoying or special all right what's next <laughs> doing well doing well <laughs> getting warmed up all right hopefully this one's a little easier for you Thank you. 
I also boosted most of the content on this. So uh, there, I already deleted a couple where I was like, no, this is, no, this is wrong. So hopefully I don't find any more. Okay, so the linter, um, all right, does anybody know what lint is? You know the word lint? Not in, in the real world, not in code. It's like lint, right? So a linter is taking the lint or like the little threads or whatever off of your, you know, code. Um, so really they should be called uh, like sort of like delinters, except they don't actually change the code. That's why they don't have delinter. Like, have you ever seen those, uh, they're like a handheld thing with like tape on it, basically? That's a delinter, right? But because it doesn't change the code, it doesn't actually remove the lint, it just points it out, okay? So imagine, you know, something doing that with cat hair, for example, it would be really annoying. You would really want it just to be linted. Um, but in the case of code, it's kind of pushing back to you. Hey, clean this up. All right, any questions? All right, feel free to ask questions. I won't move on to the next one until we do. Um, all right, progress. All right. Which of these is not a common stage in a CI pipeline? Um, this one I think is a little bit misleading, to be honest. So this activity, in a sense, is a common part of a CI system. It's just there's no computer that's doing it. Right. So in other words, you better not be starting the process without putting some documentation about what you're doing uh, into your, you know, code commits or whatever. All right. All right, we're getting some uh, contests there. Next question. Which of these is, which way, uh, is not a GitHub event? All right, how many people here know what a GitHub event is at all? If you read that reading, you should at least have talked about that. So, oh, that was pretty good, all right. Um, so I don't really have much to say about this, except that you, know, you can't trigger things based on a pull request, right? Um, no, you, oh, sorry, you can trigger it on pull requests, so I was a little confused. Um, there's no such thing as just a pull, right? Um, in the sense that the maintainers don't go and pull code from uh, another project or whatever, you always have to submit a pull request in the normal flow of things. You can literally do it. It's just kind of uncommon in bad practice. And you certainly can't automate with it unless you go outside of GitHub and like break your code or something. Uh, you pin when you're ready, I can tell you it's down in the corner. All right. All right. Oh. All right, what does YAML stand for? Uh, this is one of my favorites, except it's not recursive, so it's not perfectly awesome. Uh, this one I disagree with. I think I misread the answer. Um, this I uh, this is correct as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this is not correct. It's, and I gave a massive hit. It's not a recursive acronym. Uh, does everybody know what a recursive acronym is? It's like you're not going to use this the acronym. Yeah. Okay. What's the most famous one? You know. Which one? Okay. Okay. Uh, what about any others? Yeah. GNU. Um, so GNU is not Unix. So GNU is like what most open sources, like the concept is based on. Um, so, uh, and there's much argument about whether it's actually GNU Linux. Um, so yeah, if you don't know what GNU is, you should find out. Right, sir? Yeah. 
Oh, code. Uh, 766358. Village in? Yeah. I don't think I would block it. All right. All right. How can like the you know CI, CD, et cetera, jobs be run? This one is also very on the fence on. Yeah, so both is definitely correct. Um, it's often very confusing if you don't do things serially. Okay. However, sometimes, particularly if you're talking about like machine learning stuff, doing things in parallel is really important because you have like they just take so long, whatever they are, right? Um, so, you know, favor serially, even if it's going to add, you know, 10 minutes to some extent, because it'll be so much less confusing, but it's like, there's a threshold in there somewhere where if, if it can be, if it's going to be significantly reduced in time, push it out into parallel, you know, parallelism, right? But, and that's kind of a good programming rule in general, is that as soon as you start introducing parallelism, it makes all of your code significantly more complicated and more likely to have bugs harder for somebody else to figure out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there better be a good reason. It's kind of like recursion and parallelism. If you have a good reason, they're really good and really useful. If you don't have a good reason, um, you shouldn't be doing it. Like they're, it's kind of like the old, old school, right? Using a go-to statement in a sentence. Um, like if you have a good reason, it's really important. But if you don't, you shouldn't be using it. All right, all right, Nick, you're still leading. I want Reflect to come back though. All right, what symbol do you use to write multi line actions? Oh, I thought I deleted this one, but oh, maybe I'll get it right. So, this is the kind of question where I'm like, why would you ever know the answer to this unless you did it all day, every day? It's so easy to look up, all right? Sorry? Yeah. Um, I don't even remember this usually for like languages I use all the time, right? Like it's just not, it's so easy to find out the answer, but it's just whatever. So and that's why I said I thought I deleted this one. Oh, oh, sorry. I didn't realize somebody was passive. Um, all right, so where should you store the workflows? This is all mostly based on GitHub's uh, model for uh, uh, doing, what do we call it? Doing CI CD. Uh, so it's a little bit biased. All right, uh, looks like, wait. I kind of, you know, it's funny. That's why I keep getting confused, is because I've been using Top Hat for doing this stuff a lot lately. And then kind of use an alternate model, like, a, like the models the reverse for how to find the right answer. Uh, so dot GitHub workflows uh, versus dot Git workflows. So you, unless uh, unless you have a really good reason, kind of again, um, you should not be putting anything in dot Git ever. Okay, uh, that is managed by Git. Um, the only exception is sometimes because uh, I think hooks go there, uh, but it's kind of a rare activity. Um, Hooks actually can be super handy. Does anybody know what a Git hook is? So a Git hook is basically like, whenever I do operation in Git, do this, right? So it's basically event triggers. Um, and so it can be really handy. Like I work on projects where you have to sign every commit and I will forget to sign it. So there's a flag on commit that's like, I want to say it's minus S or something, but basically it signs it, it puts your name in the commit. Um, and I always forget. So you can write a hook that will uh, automatically sign every commit you do, for example. Um, there's lots of other ones too, but uh, in, and mostly you go kind of find them as like gists on the internet, uh, but you can also write your own. Uh, they can be super handy. Oh, actually another common one is on uh, git commit particularly um, to actually run all your unit tests is another common hook. All right. 
I like to see I like to see the sports move around. I like the people move around. All right. Um, so which of these is uh, not actually able to store source code? You know, which of these is not a way you can actually do CI CD? Correct. Um, and the particularly part of uh, odd part about this, right, is that uh, they claim they they certainly give you the impression that it is. Okay. Um, it's also largely paid for now. So uh, if you want an alternate, not that I'm biased but to the company I used to work for, but there's um, there's a, a site called Quay.io um, that is what Docker Hub used to be. It's a repository for Docker for containers. It's publicly accessible. You can also have a certain number of private ones. It'll auto build off GitHub, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's all open source. It's still free. Still, it doesn't require registration except to get the private stuff, et cetera. Um, the, the funny part about it though is, uh, does anybody know the word Q-U-A-Y in English? It's a pretty uncommon word. All right. Yeah. Is it like a river? Close, but no. Like the area around it. Specifically, it's, a, it's another word for dock. Oh, yeah. So uh, this is one of those words where um, the only way I had ever seen it was with, by reading it, right, in like books, right? And uh, so I always pronounce it quay, uh, which is incorrect. The correct, correct pronunciation is key. However, the people who do the open source project that is spelled Q-U-A-Y claim that the name of the project is quay. So just to make it extra confusing, the word is key, the project is quay, spelled the same. So I find that very amusing. I, I was very embarrassed when I used it, uh, you know, in a sentence or something in a meeting uh, and discovered that I had been pronouncing it wrong, uh, at least in my head, my whole life, right? This was literally, the reason I bring it up, like this was like five years ago. This wasn't like 30 years ago, right? I mean, this was really recent. Uh, okay. What's next? All right, what is the use of coveralls? Uh, so I probably should have killed this one. But I was kind of pulling this together really quickly for fun. All right, so the correct answer is, Sorry, correct answer is pass fail stats and get up. What is a coverage report? You all know. Correct. So it's a testing report. So basically, you know, how much of your code is actually being tested by tests? This is a number that will never or probably never get to 100%. Okay. But it is a good number to know. So even if you decide as an organization or a group or whatever, that the right number is 70%, you notice when it's 71 or 69, right? So it's important because of the, when it diffs more than what the actual number is. Does that make sense? So as part of your, you know, kind of deployment model and your development uh, kind of performance and that kind of stuff, one of the things you want to do is make sure that your test coverage is staying about the same. Um, and general, generally, you want it to improve, um, but that's uh, it's kind of like that's less important than it uh, at least staying the same. Uh, coveralls is a tool. That's why I probably should kill it. All right. Um, all right. So, anybody familiar with Travis? The reason I left this in so I can introduce Travis, uh, I'd be very surprised if any of you have used it. All right, that's pretty good. Did, did people know that or was that a wild guess that just got left? All right, um, okay, so Travis, who knows what Travis is? Louder, sorry. 
Right. So, so Travis is starting to be less known now because a lot of what GitHub Actions does is what Travis used to do, uh, or still does, really. So what Travis does is basically you can put uh, a dot file in your repo with a description of how continuous integration should work, um, and it will go and run it for you. Um, another kind of fun story there, when they were very, very small, like eight years ago, I tried to get Red Hat to buy them, and they were like, ah, there's nothing there. Uh, and then until GitHub Actions, they, uh, they basically owned the entire space. Like they, they were continuous integration on the public internet. Uh, so I was disappointed. All right. Um, yeah, so Travis is a really cool project. Product. Like I said, there's a lot of overlap now with GitHub Actions, but it still does stuff that GitHub can't. Uh, so it's worth considering if you ever need that sort of thing. All right. Sir. Oh, sorry, I thought. All right, this one you should definitely know. What does CD stand for? All right, I five out of four, it means both. Okay, so depending on the context, the person who's saying it, whatever, it sometimes means continuous deployment, sometimes continuous delivery. In the long run, it doesn't actually matter. It's the same concept, okay? Like it's just kind of how the, the end bits are happening, which one it is. All right. All right, let's take, take some more wild guesses here on Travis. Um, all right. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, that, that seems like an error. <laughs> okay, uh, so I presume most people took a wild guess on this. Um, but generally, I would say the right answer is yes, um, although apparently all of the answers are correct. Why does my gut say the answer is yes? Why do you think? Right. So environment variables uh, generally are, you know, kind of the variables you set in your environment. The way you do that depends on the platform you're using and the tool chain you're using and all that stuff. But generally it means that it's the environment. So if you're in production, that's the environment versus in dev. That's the environment. You have different variables that are accessible to the system that are available, and they're different depending on which one you're in. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, keeping that file secret is usually a better idea, because even if you didn't put any secret things in there, nobody then in the future makes a mistake. Okay. And in fact, what I'll normally do is actually have for any sort of environment variable file. I will have, you know, blah file, whatever it is, dot m dot sample, for example. Um, and that'll have the blanks for all the settable environment variables, but it won't have a real one. And then I'll set the git ignore correctly so that it'll pick up the sample, but won't pick up anything without dot sample in the end. That makes sense? So I don't need to accidentally check it in, even if I have it. Distribution of those gets to be a lot of fun when you can't use git. Nice, we had some movement there. All right, so how often should you be deployed? This one's a little bit of a trick question, too. All right. Correct answer is there is no set standard. Um, however, your team should have a set standard. Okay, so any project you're working on, you should have a plan. You should have an idea of what you're planning to do um, so that nobody gets caught off guard. Something like every week is often very dangerous because you will often, if it's an automated plan, especially, you will catch somebody off guard invariably. 
somebody gets sick, somebody you know just missed the memo, forgot it was Friday, etc. So I would normally do it on every code commit, uh, not every code commit really, sorry, every PR merge, um, so that I can basically I'm choosing as the author of the PR. All right, I'm satisfied with this. I think it's done. Let me push it, and then it gets automatically rolled out. All right. Definitely mixing it up. Some people are better guessers than others, I think. All right. What encourages good coding practices and early detection of integration problems? Again, y'all should know this. And it should be easy. Unless the kind internet stranger that produced most of this, I guess, here. Continuous integration is 100% the right answer. All right. So basically, continuously merging code with others. Um, this is the big thing you're looking for is early detection of integration points. Secondarily, you usually get good coding practices because um, now your stuff's in public, right? Your stuff is in public like this. The more in public your code is, the better you will write code. Okay. That's part of the reason for the deployment assignment is that I want you producing stuff that's in public as fast as possible. I actually would like, like in future iterations of this class, I would actually like that um, that assignment to be like within the first few weeks of the course starting. Just we got a little bit rocky start this semester, so I kind of got the lead on, on doing it. So basically, whenever you're setting up a new project, setting up continuous integration, uh, and to some extent, continuous deployment from the get go is almost always a good idea. All right. Oh, we're fine. This coming up. You guys better start getting the answers right. All right. What is continuous delivery? So this is, uh, I would say, a matter of definitions. So this is one interpretation, okay? I don't necessarily, like, I, I think if I had built this, uh, I would probably say this is probably also correct. It's kind of like, that's the distinction between like continuous delivery, continuous deployment, that kind of stuff. I bet you you won't even necessarily find a consistent answer to this question at different organizations. Well, they're like in one organization you will, but if you go to another one, they'll have a different definition or a different opinion. Um, personally, this is my preference down here uh, because like this whole, have you ever heard of DevOps? I think I talked about it in this class before, right? But it's like, as a developer, why would I want DevOps? I want to throw it over the wall to testing and ops and forget it ever existed as quickly as humanly possible, right? I want to write the code and I want to run off my next thing. Um, I don't want to fix bugs. I don't want to have to like get woken up at two in the morning because it's not working. None of that stuff. There's people who do that. Um, sadly, that's probably not the right answer for most applications. Um, but yeah, so I'm kind of on the fence on this one. Uh, okay, this one you should definitely know. What are small, loosely coupled services that make up a larger application? All right, nice. Uh, I don't know if you can get any more S's in, like, it'd be nice if this was a thing, because that's a lot of S's. Um, but yeah, microservices, um, which basically is the same thing as service-oriented architecture, uh, it's just smaller, and usually bottom-up versus top-down uh, from uh, how they make decisions about what gets built. Um, all right, let's see.
So we have a team working on this problem in the classroom, right? Or is that the other class? No, I think it's this class. Oh, sorry. Um, so monitoring is the correct answer. Uh, why did I say that there's a team working on this? Team that is doing it realize that they're doing monitoring. All right, so anomaly detection. Uh, that, like, the problem with monitoring is monitoring is great and all, but nobody cares if the if the project if the application is just doing everything normally, right? What you care about is anomalies, like somebody kicked out the power cord, right? That's what you care about. So. Monitoring is kind of a loose term for what, the, what you're really looking for problems. Um, and those problems shift uh, over time. So, um, so yeah, monitoring is a good thing, um, but right, generally speaking, what you're actually looking for is change. All right, what is the process that automatically compiles files into usable form? So, yeah, I'll wait for my comments. Build automation uh, looks like the correct answer. Um, personally, I would also accept the continuous deployment. I do notice that two people said orchestration. So that is not what orchestration is. So orchestration is like, think like a microservices environment. How do you get all of those different services to make sure they're all still working? So it's orchestration like, think like a conductor in an orchestra. Okay, so a conductor is making sure the violins play at the right time, the cellos play at the right time. Same idea. So your orchestrator is keeping track of are all these services available and are they doing their thing? Um, so very, very important. If you've ever heard of Kubernetes, probably the hottest project right now uh, in the open source world, that is an orchestrator, uh, specifically of containers primarily, Although they also do uh, like virtual machines and stuff. Actually, if you want to know more about virtual machines in Kubernetes, uh, my Twitch show is on Tuesday morning, and I'm interviewing some of the uh, contributors to that code base. Yeah, next Tuesday. All right, what is infrastructure as code mean? And I was disappointed to discover that this is not in that article I, I sent you. Uh, I may I may switch for next time I, I do this kind of thing because this is a very important term. All right, infrastructure as code is managing infrastructure using code and automation. Why is treating infrastructure as code important? What, what benefit does it bring? Any ideas? So imagine that your infrastructure, so VMs and containers and code bases and what servers are on and all that stuff, if you're writing that all in some code, like some language, right? But you're putting it in Git, what is, what's the advantage? What would be a huge advantage to that? Any ideas? You can monitor change. Okay, so every time there's a commit, you see diffs. So when you all of a sudden start having an outage because some container service or whatever isn't there anymore, what can you do? You can go and look at the diff and you can find out what changed, right? Which you cannot do if you're just clicking buttons in EC2, right? So that's why it's so important. Um, you know, the automation is super nice as well uh, and ensures that things happen consistently and consistently correctly in a sense. But really what you're looking for is that now you know, you know, at this point in time, we released this code and we made these changes to the configuration. Those all went out into deployment and now everything's broken. So you can find out exactly what changed. All right. 
like I pushed down the mountain. Hey, look at that. I think I, uh, I thought the earlier question, which mentioned work construction, was this question. All right. Um, probably not the phrasing I would use, but not bad. Um, so basically, you know, orchestration is, like I said, exactly what it sounds like if you think about the English word. Um, and uh, it's becoming, particularly when you talk about a microservices environment, hugely important because there's just too many things going on for a human to keep track. And is there one more? Oh, sorry. All right, what is the benefit of configuration management? So I'm curious if any of you have even seen this term. I can't remember if it was in that article or not. And I think this is the last question. All right, anybody know what configuration management is? All right, so we talk about infrastructure as code, using a tool to uh, that you can write code for that will execute your infrastructure. So has anybody here heard of, um, uh, I want to say TensorFlow, it's not TensorFlow, uh, Terraform. Um, Terraform is one, uh, Vagrant is actually a very, very useful one that you can use on your own computer. Uh, to some extent, a container file uh, or a Docker file is the same idea, but configuration management is usually the software system that kind of runs those things. So like um, the most well-known is probably called Puppet. Um, there's one that is from my former employer that I use all the time called Ansible. Um, and uh, I don't know, like there's, there's a couple others that are kind of dying. Uh, so it's basically, those are probably the two biggest right now. I don't know, am I missing? Oh. Well, like probably yeah. Ansible. I, yeah, I mean, I think um, Chef is really dying. Yeah, Chef. But, but then I was thinking too, when you think of like Terraform, each of the cloud vendors has their own sort right. of configuration. Yeah. yeah. So ARM templates and Azure, right? Right, right. So, so, like, so. yeah, this this term has also gotten a little sticky because uh, it used to be very clearly Puppet, Chef, Ansible, like those were the answer to that question. These days, it's gotten a little bit messier with all the cloud environments, all the cloud environments having kind of their own versions. And like I was saying before, with all those microservices, there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen. And it's all got, there's various ways it can be done. So they have, so there's a lot of competition in this space right now uh, without, uh, you know, like a clear winner at the moment. So as a result, you know, different interpretations make it mean slightly different things. Does that make sense? Right. There's a lot of stuff in our space, right, where if you look at it at any point in time, it, it can be really messy and then it'll like settle down eventually um, until it then gets messy again. But, all right, I think that was the last one.